Hello, Biola. Hey, I want to give a shout out to uh, my friend, Matt Williams. And uh, man, I just want you to know, Matt, how much I love you. And uh, man, just how much I'm rooting you on. So many Biola students here as well. And uh, we have several that uh, attend our church cross point. And so I just want you to know that I am rooting each and every one of you on. And today I want to share my story of, of the instead in my life and how I had to put my hope in the steadfast God. Now, just to tell you my story, I actually uh, grew up with a drug problem. Uh, I was drugged to church every Sunday morning. I was drugged to church every Sunday night, and I was drugged to church every Wednesday night. Uh, my, my family was in ministry, so I was constantly uh, at church. And, and I, I love church and, and I love ministry. And I actually grew up a uh, part of an incredible youth ministry and had a youth pastor that, that mentored me. And then when I was 16, I went to youth camp, uh, like some of you have been to youth camp. And when I was at camp, I just felt God's call upon my life uh, to go into full-time Christian ministry. Now, through my teenage years, my, my loves were, were Jesus, basketball, and girls. And not always in that order, I'm ashamed to admit, uh, but then came time to graduate and uh, I got a scholarship to play basketball at a school very similar uh, to Biola in the Midwest. And, and I went to the school and I, and I loved the school and, and God just had his hand of favor and blessing. And, and I had such a great life growing up and I always felt that things were just God would put things in place and position them and everything was just kind of, you know, up and to the right in my life. Uh, I remember uh, playing basketball, loving it, meeting some of my lifelong friends. Uh, I was honored to be an All-American and uh, even set the school scoring record. So that was going well in my life. Uh, I started dating and I eventually married uh, this beautiful girl uh, that loved Jesus, loved ministry, loved me. And then I went and started our, our ministry and God had his hand of favor on us as we were a youth pastor in Oklahoma and everything was going well. But then things begin to change in my life. And God began to work deep into my soul on me. And, and I realized that I lived life for significance. And some of you may relate with this because, you know, significance uh, has some upsides and downsides. And the upside is, you know, God had given me some gifts to be able to grow and build things and, and, and to be able to use some gifts that he'd given me. But at the same time, there were some downsides as well, too. And significance, what I felt was, I'm, I'm a goal setter, is that I, I was always wanting to do significant things and significant things for God. And, and I would set goals. And some of you are goal setters and, and you set a goal. And what happens when you miss it? When you miss the goal, you feel like a loser. You feel like you're not enough. You feel like you, 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 you missed it and, and, and you feel bad. But here's what's worse. When you actually hit your goals and, and you find success in life, because once you hit your goal, then all of a sudden you turn around and you celebrate and then you immediately say, what's next? Now what? See, it's a game you could never win. And then God also began to, to just touch my heart on, on ego because with significance is also ego and E-G-O, ego is edging God out. And, and I realized that sometimes life was about me rather than about God. And God had to teach me that Brian, it's not about you. It's about me. And for you, you might take your finger right now and just kind of poke yourself and say, it's not about me. It's about him. As John said, he, he must increase. I must decrease. And then about two and a half years ago, I found myself at a, at a really bad spot and, and I'm in ministry, but, and, and I never really lacked confidence, but I lost my confidence and I, I felt like I hit rock bottom. And have you ever hit rock bottom and then realize that rock bottom has a trap door. That's kind of what happened to me. So here's my story of my instead where I had to put my hope in a steadfast God. I actually got a call from, from my brother. And I told you my, my, my mom and dad are in ministry. My dad's a pastor. And uh, I have two younger brothers that are 10 and 15 years younger than me, but both of them uh, are pastors in, in Texas. And I got a call uh, that my father uh, had made a mistake and had an affair um, on my mom. And this was something that just kind of rocked my world. And I remember getting on an airplane here at LAX and, and taking this emergency trip back to the Midwest. And me and my brothers uh, went to confront my dad. And we, we sat down with him on a couch. And, and my prayer was this, is that my dad would repent, 
that, that he would reconcile with my mom and that he would have to probably resign his church. And that day God showed up and answered our prayers. And my dad had this Psalm 51, just David repentance, brokenness moment. My dad's a leader, tough, strong guy, but he was broken. He repented. And then my dad said he wanted to reconcile with my mom and put it back together. And then we talked about his church and he's like, what, what am I going to do? And I said, dad, you, you got to step down. I mean, you've disqualified yourself for now. I mean, in this season and, and in this moment of probably anger, he's like, what am I going to do? And I was like, well, you're going to do what every other pastor does that has a moral failure. I mean, you're, you're going to go sell something. You're going to sell insurance or sell cars or you're, you're, you're a really good salesperson. And then my brother speaks up and my brother says, Dad, we got to get everything out because there's been a lot of secrets and I'm just scratching the surface of some of the stuff that we found out. And he said, we need to know everything. And so at that moment, my brother said, is Brian your biological son? And my dad says, no. And it blindsided me. Have you ever been blindsided? I mean, I didn't see it coming. I mean, I'm 41 years old. And I was like, I, I got to take a walk. I remember taking this walk and, and we were in Louisiana and I'm down walking this dirt road. And, and I was like, God, what is going on? And, and, and I remember calling my mom and the conversation didn't go the way that I wanted it to go. And, and I was just like, what is happening? And I got in the car and I, I drove back to Dallas and my confidence was just shaken. And I, I felt like it was a, a storm that I didn't know how to get out of. And, and I felt broken for the first time in my life. I felt lost. I lost my identity. I didn't know who I was. And the next day I'm sitting at this on the border in Dallas, Texas, Mexican restaurant. And I'm like, I want to know who my dad is. So I'm, I'm upset at my mom at the time. So, so I don't reach out to her, but I reach out to my aunt and my aunt, she, uh, she's like, I can't believe you found out. She's like, I thought this was going to the grave. I said, do you know who my dad is? And she said, yeah, his name's Dino. I'm like, Dino. I'm like, am I part of the Italian mafia, Dino? And she's like, you need to know that when you were a baby, he held you in his arms. And you need to know that he was a drug dealer and he was a bad dude. And when, when your mom found out that she was pregnant with you, she kicked him out and said she never wants him to be involved in your life. And she said, but he knows you. He knows who you are. He's held you. And I'm like, what's his last name? She's like, I, I don't know. And I'm thinking, man, I'm from this little small town, St. Joseph, Missouri. His name's Dino. He's probably in his early sixties. I'm like, I find this guy. So sure enough, I go to Facebook and I start investigating and it doesn't take me 10 minutes. And I find his picture and I realize he can't grow any hair right here in his mustache, which is uh, just like me. And then I noticed that he like gains a bunch of weight. Then he loses a bunch of weight. I'm like, that's so me. And then I see this big smile in all of his pictures. And I'm like, that's my dad. But, but I have this fear of rejection. I have this fear of reaching out. And then I realized that, man, I have a brother and I have a sister that I, I look more like than even the family that I grew up with. And I'm like, I want to know who they are. Am I like him? Do I talk like him? Do, do I have mannerisms like him? Is, is he a leader? I want to know who's my dad. And so I tried to reach out. I couldn't. And finally I sent him a Facebook message and I found out that he told my mom whenever he, uh, whenever he and my mom kind of had this exchange, he told my mom that he didn't want to interfere in her life or my family. He just wanted to see me one time. So that's the message that I sent him on Facebook. I just said, I don't want to interfere, interfere with your family or life. I just want, to have one opportunity to have a conversation with you, if you will allow me to. He reached out to me and confirmed he was my dad. And here's the crazy part. He's a pastor. He, uh, he got saved three months after he found out about me in a state of depression and drugs. And he put his faith and trust in Christ. God called him into ministry. And 41 years later, we reunited but as I was dealing with all of this, I just want to tell you what God taught me. Cause maybe you find yourself in a storm right now. Maybe you've lost your identity. Maybe, maybe in the middle of this pandemic, you've just lost hope and you're in this instead moment and you need to understand a steadfast God. I, I decided in this period of my time when I was just broken and loss of identity and loss of hope 
loss of confidence. I decided to read through the Psalms. I mean, the Psalms are David's journal. And and here's what I I read and it just hit me. And and man, for some of you, I I want to encourage you to highlight this verse, mark it down at Psalm 52, eight. David said, I'm like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. And immediately I was like, well, what does it mean to be an olive tree? I'm an olive tree. Listen, you're an olive tree and, and I want to be like an olive tree. And, and I did some study on olive trees. And did you know that olive trees, they can grow as high as 20 feet tall. There's olive trees in Israel that have been there for over 2000 years. And here's the amazing part about an olive tree is that it thrives in soil that is filled with rocks. It thrives in the rocky soil, in the challenging times, in the difficult times. And if you find yourself in rocky soil right now, I want you to be like David who says, I'm an olive tree. Listen, in Matthew 13, it's the parable of the sower. I think it would be better said the parable of the soils. Because there's different soil. And one of the soils that Jesus talks about is the rocky soil. And Jesus says, that's when problems and persecutions come. And because of problems and persecutions, you can't bear much fruit. But here's what an olive tree does. This is what David says. He says that I can actually thrive in the middle of the rocky soil. When problems and persecutions come my way, I can still grow. I can still bear fruit because my hope isn't based upon me. My hope isn't based upon if I hit my goals. My hope isn't based upon all the circumstances and situations that are going around with me. My hope is found in a steadfast God because I'm an olive tree that can thrive. I don't have to just survive right now. I I can thrive when I understand my identity. And here's the beauty, the olive tree, man, that's where the olives are produced and the olives are where we get the olive oil that anointed the Kings of Israel. When David was anointed, they took the oil and they put it all over his head and said, this is the anointing of God. You can experience in the anointing that actually comes from the olive tree that thrives in the problems and the persecutions and the stone and the stony ground. You can experience this whenever you have a walk in a relationship with God. You know, in James, it says when people are sick, you should call on the elders to anoint them with oil. Listen, that oil is coming from the olive oil. And here's what's amazing. Wine is produced from, from, the, from the olives. That This beautiful wine comes from the crushing. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, it was there that he was in the presence of God. He would constantly come back to the garden where all of these olive trees were, these probs and these persecutions. There is God right in the middle of it. And I love the next verse. I'm like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. And and maybe for some of you, you don't know who your father is. You don't know who your mother is. Maybe you've had a broken relationship and you feel lost. I want you to know that God loves you. One of my favorite verses is in Ephesians chapter one. It says, even before God made the world, God loved you and he chose you in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And then this is in verse nine. I will praise you forever that I'm going to praise you in the storm. I'm going to praise you even when I'm in rocky ground. I'm going to worship you, oh God, for what you have done, because you are the steadfast one. I will trust in your good name. Listen, when you can't trust in the name of other people, listen, maybe you've been through a breakup. Maybe you've been through a relational loss and you cannot trust in other people's names. You can always trust in the name of God. His name is righteous. His name is holy. That's where you receive your power. This is how you bear fruit. And it says, and in the presence of your faithful people, listen, I'm so grateful for the support that I had. When you go through challenges, people, they don't need to be fixed. What they need is they need other faithful people that are there to support them. Listen, your friends, they're like elevator buttons. They'll either take you up or they'll take you down. And I want to leave you with one last verse in John 13. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear no fruit. 
He says this, if you remain in me and I remain in you. So how about it, Biola? Will you be an olive tree? Thank you, Brian, for bringing us that powerful message. Um, you know, even as I was listening to it, I just thought this sounds like a plot twist in a movie or a book, like something almost unbelievable, but it happened to you. And not just you, because I think of something like this, it didn't just affect you and your dad. I imagine the repercussions kind of went out and out and out. Um, so one thing I'm wondering is like, what is your relationship like with your mom now? Yeah, that's such a great question. And, you know, I, I, I love my mom. Uh, and my mom struggled with this, too, because, um, you know, this was a this was a part of a secret for a mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. And it also was a part of betrayal that I felt as well, too. And, you know, her and I had to had to walk this tension and we had to manage this tension for a while. And, uh, you know, I, I had a counselor that was helping me walk through this. Good. And one of the things that, that I, I felt that God was leading me to was keep pushing in when you feel like pulling out. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that for me, the big thing was forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And you don't forgive uh, for the other person. You right. forgive for yourself because you don't want those, that bitterness. I, I've heard it said that unforgiveness is like drinking a bottle of poison, waiting for the other person to die. And I knew for myself and my own emotional health for what the purpose that God had for me that I needed to forgive. And, and there may be some students that are even listening to this right now that have been hurt. Maybe it's a different story than me, but mm -hmm. we've all been hurt by people. I mean, Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them betrayed him. So mm -hmm. if you got at least 12 friends, you're going to have at least one yep, that will probably sure. betray you. And I think that what God taught me was sometimes you have to, you're not letting them off the hook. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people don't respond the way you want them to respond, but sometimes you got to let them off of your hook and you put them on God's hook. Uh, Romans chapter 12 um, it, it specifically, I love this verse is never pay back evil with more mm -hmm. evil, mm -hmm. do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable and then do all you can to live at peace with all men. And, and I knew that I needed it for me to heal. You can't heal, uh, until you, until you forgive. And I think forgiveness is relinquishing your right to get even mm -hmm. it says, I'm not going to try to get even. I'm not going to try to pay back. And I, I, I needed to forgive for me to be able to experience healing in my yeah. life. And you mentioned too, that forgiveness is pushing in when you feel like pulling back. Mm -hmm. So what, what did that look like for you? How did you push in when you wanted to pull back? I made a phone call. I made a couple phone calls because I think my mom didn't want to make the phone call and it was mm -hmm. her and she didn't know what to say. And after you say you're sorry, what else do you say? Right. And, and I felt like I had to continue to keep building a bridge there with some boundaries and, and we, we ha, we're still walking through it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is two and a half years ago. Uh, but I think, you know, C.S. Lewis said too, and I have to keep forgiving. C.S. Lewis said, you know, 70 times seven, that doesn't mean 490 forgiveness, different offenses. Sometimes it can be the same offense mm -hmm. that keeps coming back in your mind. And I got to forgive it 70 times seven right. and keep forgiving that so that um, it, it, for, for our future. But I feel like that, my mom, I needed to keep calling so she knew that I'm not writing her off and relationships are important to God. And she's my mom. Mm -hmm. She raised me. And at the beginning of this thing, there was a piece. She wanted what was best for me. Sure. Yeah. That's a great perspective. So another key relationship, you had a father that raised you mm -hmm. and by all accounts raised you well. Uh, he was a pastor. He apparently loved you in such a way that it wasn't obvious to you that you were not his biological son. Perhaps he didn't treat you different than your other two brothers. Um, but he had to be greatly impacted by all this as well. So tell me how that has. I was blindsided by mm -hmm. this information. And the fact I was blindsided is a testimony to how much he treated me like I was his mm -hmm. biological son. And I, I called my dad and I told him that I had to get through some hurt. I needed some space and I needed some time. So it, it took some time to process through this, mm -hmm. but, but I told my dad that he will always be my father. 
Uh, the fact that I was so blindsided tells me how much he loved me and cared for me. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting though, is I, I am different than him. And dots started connecting uh, Okay. of the differences between him and where I'm at. But that doesn't change the fact that in God's sovereign plan, he saw that he was my dad who was supposed to be the one to teach me, raise me, teach me to grow closer to God. Mm. And I'm grateful and thankful for that. So as you put those dots together, mm -hmm. right, you realize, you know, I don't maybe look like my father the way my brothers right. do. And, and you mentioned your identity was just kind of shattered. Yeah. And I think as you look back, you go, you know, what is true? What isn't true? Your yeah. whole foundation was pretty rattled. Mm -hmm. So how did you go about building or rebuilding an identity on a solid foundation? Yeah. I, I, I first of all, I went to the Psalms and mm -hmm. I feel like that if you're, you're, you're struggling, I love the Psalms because David is just real mm -hmm. and he just, it's his journal and you know, doubt and faith can coexist together. Yes. And, and I love the passage whenever the, uh, the you know, the, the father, you know, came to Jesus and said, can you help me with my son who, mm -hmm. who needs healed? And, and, and he says, if you can. And Jesus said, what do you mean if I can? He says, all things are possible with God. And, and then he says, well, uh, I believe, but help my, help unbelief. my unbelief. And, mm -hmm. and that's such a doubt and faith can coexist together. And so in my journey, there were doubts mm -hmm. and, and there's faith. And God can handle all of that, but he really took me back to Ephesians 1. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians 1 is where I had to learn my identity in Christ that, uh, you know, I quoted it in, 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 the, in, the, um, in, in the message today that God loved me. He chose me. He chose me where I was supposed to go, where he wanted me. And God decided in advance to adopt me mm -hmm. into his own family by bringing me to himself that where he is there, I can be also, you know, and, and it brought him great pleasure mm -hmm. is what he says. And, and I, I memorized Ephesians one, uh, just so that when the enemy sneaks up in the battlefield of my mind, I can be able to defeat it with the truth of God's word and to take his promises. And I think that's how the instead moves into hope and the steadfast God. Yeah. You've got to know the word, hide God's word in your heart so that you won't sin against him so that you can defeat the enemy who's lying in your mind. Mm -hmm. And was that something you did directly in response to this unsettled time in your life or had you already memorized Ephesians 1? No, I had not memorized it. As a matter of fact, I had uh, some prayer team members that, that prayed over me at our church and they prayed for my identity. And mm. it was then that I, uh, I just went back and said, where do I know scripture talks about this? What, what does the Bible say? And I mean, it was like Ephesians 1. So I did that after mm -hmm. I went through this to help me rebuild my faith in God my mm -hmm. faith in who he is. I needed a rock in the middle of a storm. I didn't want to build my life on the sand that falls apart. It's got to be built on the rock. Absolutely. So good. Well, such great encouragements for us. And thank you so much for being here, for sharing your story, for just kind of giving us a glimpse of how God used it in your life and an encouragement for us of how he can be there for our rocky times my as well. Honor. So thank you. And if I can ever support or help anyone that may be going through a similar struggle or story, uh, man, I'd, I'd love to be able to support or help any way I can. Well, great. They know where to find you. Cross yeah. Point in Cross Point Anaheim. Church at Anaheim. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.